Take your Bibles, if you would, and let's return to our study of Luke's gospel and this unfolding of the death and burial of Jesus Christ. It is a long section in Luke's gospel, and many things take place in the life of our Lord on the way to the cross. The writer of Hebrews says that our Lord has become a merciful and faithful high priest. Why? Because the text says that since he himself was tested in that which he has suffered, he was tested in all of his sufferings, tested by his heavenly father, tested by the temptations of the world, tested by the life of infirmities which he took on when he took on humanity, tested in everything that he suffered. And that is why he's able to come to the aid of those who are tested. He was tempted in all things, Hebrews 4.15, yet without sinning. That is our encouragement. That is our greatest encouragement that our master, our savior, Jesus Christ, has faced the test of tests the battle of all battles, the battle to end them all, the incomprehensible physical suffering, but ultimately the spiritual suffering that took place, and yet doing it while innocent in and of himself and doing it for our sakes, he remained under it. That's That is the most shocking reality of all. He never ran. He never self-pitied. He went toward it and he remained under the full and excruciating and alienating, crushing weight of the curse of our sin. And he in it did not sin. He did not. So the ultimate purpose that comes to us in telling us these things is that when we have a need, it is the triumph of Christ that exceeds our burdens. We already know it. We should never say it's too much. We should never say I cannot do it. We should never say I cannot handle it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is utterly clear. He is faithful to never allow us to be tested beyond our faith. Beyond what we can respond to righteously by faith. He is faithful in that. And even if we were pushed to the very brink, he has gone further. When you and I are in trouble, our soul is refreshed by this. It is the comfort of a victor that has blazed the trail that we will never have to blaze. We battle temptation, but his strength flows through our spiritual life. Strengthens our spiritual muscles. Well, when we come to what begins to take place in the upper room, we find that encouragement is absolutely crucial for us. Jesus was with his friends, you remember. He's in the upper room, but as Luke records, he's about to be very much alone. No one will face what he is going to face because he is going to face sin alone. He is going to die alone. And this night, with his beloved friends around the table, one of them will be the instrument through which he will face Satan in a way that none of them will ever face. Luke 22, verse 21. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with me on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going to go as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. They began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. Matthew and Mark record that when this statement was made, there was 
a comment at the end of it that Luke does not record. The Son of Man is to go just as it has been written, just as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he'd not been born. Judas was there in the room. It's interesting that Luke can sometimes move the chronology around. According to Matthew 26 and Mark 14 and then John 13, where you see the upper room really unfold in a lot of details and even the washing of the feet, it's interesting that in those gospels, if you read them together, they seem to indicate that Judas was outed as the betrayer and dismissed from this gathering before the celebration of the Lord's table. Scholars disagree on this. Some believe that he was there for the celebration of the Lord's table. But if you read the three synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and, and, uh, and then you read or the two synoptics and then John's gospel, it seems to indicate from the details that Judas was dismissed before the Lord's table. Luke then, if that's the case, puts the Lord's table up front as we studied last week and then puts the outing of the betrayer into this particular sequence. And I believe there may be a reason Luke did that. It may be that because Luke records what happens after Judas is exposed, the disciples, verse 23, were discussing among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be the greatest. We certainly don't know the sequence of when that little dispute came up, but it seems that Luke is placing it here to demonstrate the contrast. Yes, the immaturity on the part of the disciples. Yes, they are arguing, and probably because, as Jesus says, one of you will betray me, woe to that man, and they began to discuss this amongst themselves. It may very well be that that turned into a bragging about who has been the most faithful. And so Luke would have us think our way through these things principally rather than always chronologically. We know that Satan had already entered into Judas, John 13, 27, at this point when they're in the upper room. And according to that same text in John 13, as soon as Judas was outed, he left immediately Seems then reasonable to imagine that this particular moment highlighting the betrayer comes just before the moments that we looked at last week when Luke had a purpose of putting the Lord's table event up front. This is now an absolute change in the fellowship. They had been having a meal. They had been eating. They had all been participating. Judas was in the room. But darkness fell over the fellowship. Darkness came over the fellowship. Verse 21, Jesus says, but behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. Now, for a moment, we have to look at what is going on with the Lord, which is recorded by John in John 13. So look there for a moment. Luke does not record how this moment began to shift from the disciples enjoying a meal together and before the celebration of the Lord's table, if that's what we have in the sequence, Luke does not record what was going on with the Lord at the time. Of course, Luke was not in the room. His account comes later. But in John's account, John is in the room. And as I said, he is to the right of the Lord and his, he is reclining toward the Lord so that his head is near where the Lord is reclining here right behind him. So they are sitting next to one another. In John chapter 13, verse 21, 
When Jesus had said this, speaking about those who receive me, receive the Father who sent me. When Jesus had said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. At the moment that Jesus says, look, behold, Luke records that he says, behold, pay attention. The meal mood is shifting. Darkness is coming over this fellowship. John records that he became deeply troubled. It had been a warm and humble moment when he had washed their feet. Judas likely being there for that. The foot washing was tender. It was him serving them. And later when they get into the dispute about who's the greatest, he's going to refer to it. Do you know what I have done to you? He said after the foot washing. Later he'll say, look, you have been with me, but the greatest is the servant among you, not those who get the chief seats. You're missing the importance here. The warmth and humility of the foot washing was turned now to deep emotion which is beginning to shake Jesus. Why? He says it. One of you. One of you. No, no wonder verse 22 says the disciples began looking at one another at a loss to know of which one he was speaking. We've always said Judas was the most trusted and likely to his left. Was Jesus thinking of someone close to the 12 they might have been imagining? Is he speaking of some inadvertent, rather ignorant betrayal? Something that, that just sort of happened? Someone stumbled into it? No doubt at this point, Judas is sinking into his place at the table. For all of his personal animosity toward Jesus, which we've studied in the life of Judas before, it was now that his hatred for Christ would be at its peak. He'd already had so many experiences where he might very well have betrayed him earlier were it not for the purposes and plan of Almighty God, but he had been openly rebuked when he was at Lazarus' home and exposed in his pretense. A humiliation in that moment would have made a proud, arrogant, lying deceiver like Judas very, very angry and bitter and resentful, hateful, Furthermore, his guilt was always exposed. I mean, you're around Christ. We sort of hide our guilt when we're around other people, even righteous people, because while their life may expose us, we, we can find ways to say, oh, you're, per you're not perfect. You're no better than me. You, you're not, you've got flaws in your life. You're human. And that salves our conscience when their righteous life is exposing us. Not so with the disciples. They're always around Christ. And so while the others struggled with their sin and intimidation and insecurity around the Lord, he was constantly gathering his disciples around him to comfort their hearts and let them know to draw near to him. Judas, on the other hand, his guilt, his hatred for Christ would bring such piercing guilt from the Lord's life. And here it is. He's in the room not sure when the moment will come, either here or in the garden, to finally pull off the betrayal. And Jesus knows the awful plot and can see right into his heart. And so, verse 23, there was one reclining on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. This is John's way of referring to himself. Third party Simon Peter gestured to him. You remember I told you that the table might have been in a U-shape and so you have Jesus here at that, op that honored guest seat and then you have John here on the corner and then you have Judas next to him and all the way around. So Peter's probably right over here, maybe even took the least, 
seat, the one furthest away from Jesus, having been really such a foot-in-mouth disciple. But it probably made John close enough to Peter that Peter could speak across the table right there. Ask him. Tell us who it is of whom he's speaking. And so he, verse 25, leaning back thus on Jesus' chest, said to him, Lord, who is it? Who is it? And Jesus said, This is the one for whom I shall dip the morsel and give it to him. <laughs> I mean, we've all been taking our bread and dipping it. We've all been doing that. Lord, who is it? And so when he had dipped the morsel, he took it and he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Matthew's gospel says that Judas had said to him, surely it's not I. And Jesus looked at him and said, you said it yourself. It, it may be that they were close enough, as I said, maybe Judas to the left, that he heard that, that he spoke to Jesus in a way that the others did not hear. Surely, not me. Keeping up the pretense, hatred in his heart, Satan moving him in the direction of the betrayal, all of that rising up, and in a desperate pretense, it's not, it's not I. And Jesus, Jesus said, that you said it yourself. Quiet enough, it seems, that the others didn't, didn't understand it. Verse 27, after the morsel, Satan then entered into him. That is to say, this got to its zenith level. In other words, not, he, Satan had already entered into him to get to this point. Satan's entered into him to take him out of the room and finish the job. Now, no one of those reclining at the table knew for what purpose he'd said this to him. They were supposing because Judas had the money box that Jesus was saying, buy the things we have need of for the feast or else that he should go give something to the poor. Dipping the morsel and offering it to a guest was a, a mark of friendship, honor, Jesus offers a gesture of honor. That's how he outs Judas. That's how he lets Judas know he knows what's up. That's how he puts it to the heart of Judas so that the heart can be completely and utterly exposed. He's totally open to Satan, totally open to the evil course that he's been on. He is wide open to it, ready for it, wants it. And in that moment, Jesus gestures in an honoring way to his enemy at the precise moment that Jesus, in his sovereignty, allows Satan to possess the enemy's heart. There's no one else in the room at this point that even matters to the circumstance. It is Jesus and it is Satan entering Judas' heart. Judas is the instrument and Jesus is letting Judas know and Jesus himself is sovereignly carrying out this lonely moment. He has commissioned the darkness that comes over the fellowship. He has commissioned his betrayer and spoken to him and gestured to him as an honored friend. Back to Luke. Behold, the hand of the one betraying me, verse 21, is with mine on the table. There it is. There is the same sort of picture of what is happening. He's with mine on the table. This is a friend. This is someone who's been with us. I've not, I've not done anything other than bring him along. But while there was darkness over the fellowship... Jesus indicates by his next words that there is sovereignty over the darkness. 
There's not only darkness over the fellowship, but right there in Jesus' words, there is sovereignty over the darkness. Verse 22, for indeed, that is emphatic. Know this, indeed for certain, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. Now stop right there. You, you know that Son of Man is the sin bearer title. Every word is chosen by the Lord carefully to send the clear message. The sin bearer is in the room. He is the son of man. That is, of course, a tie to his being from Nazareth, but in the line of King David by birth. He is the son of David, as Bartimaeus yelled out when Jesus was there in Jericho. This is, of course a connection to the genealogical line that Matthew records in Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So he is the rightful heir to the everlasting throne first given to his father, which is spoken of in Luke 1.32 when the angel announced it. From the Old Testament, this term, son of man, it, it literally means human being, it is to distinguish him as one of us so that we never get the idea that God's work of redemption is removed from us for there could be no redemption if he did not become one of us. The words are chosen very carefully. Know for certain, Jesus says, that the sin bearer, the son of man, he is in the room this is, of course, a reflection of what the prophets had said, Daniel being the most notable. One like a son of man was in Daniel's vision. It refers to the limitations of human weakness. And, of course, in Numbers 23, 19, God is not a man that he should lie. That distinguishes the limitations of human weakness from the infinite glory of God. So here is Jesus, the Son of God, who also took on our infirmities. In the Gospels, the title, the Son of Man, is used by Jesus in reference to his work on earth and his affliction and his kingdom authority to reign over all things. He is our substitute, as we saw last week. He is the sin bearer. Sometimes people don't understand when he uses terms like that, but you will note that in the New Testament, it had to be a man because he is, as Paul told the Corinthians, the second Adam. There was a first Adam. The first Adam pressed through the barriers that God had set. The first Adam became arrogant, the self-worshipper, the one who plunged us into corruption, the one whose nature became corrupt because as a man he did not stand in the righteousness of his creator. There had to be a second Adam. And Jesus could never redeem through the sacrifice if he wasn't willing to take the place of the first Adam and partake in human flesh, Hebrews 2.14. The children, the offspring of God, the creatures who are of the creator, since they have flesh and blood, they share in flesh and blood, then he himself likewise also partook of the same. Why? Because through death he would render powerless him who had the power of death, which is the devil. So he had to be the son of man, and Jesus chooses those words right here to, to say right in front of Judas, his betrayer, when he gives an honoring and friendship gesture, the sin bearers in the room. And why is Jesus saying it? Because he wants his disciples to know what, what he said there recorded in verse 22. He, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. As it has been determined. I read Psalm 41. You remember verse 9. It should have, it should have piqued your memory when... The psalmist, David, said, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, lifted up his heel against me. This is, this is the psalmist writing down by the inspiration of the Spirit a forward-looking prospect of one who would come, and it would be the Lord himself. The prophet said it. God had said it. 
The scripture had to be fulfilled. I've often thought, why wasn't, <clears throat> I mean, why did it take a betrayer? I mean, you don't need a betrayer. If Jesus is public on the Temple Mount preaching and the Pharisees hate him, just have the Sanhedrin arrest him or have Rome arrest him and, and the insurrection accusation be the thing that does it and just bring him. Why a betrayer? Because the scriptures were to be fulfilled because God wanted everyone to know for all time that the human heart which is fallen if left to itself will be against God perennially eternally man cannot solve his own problem he can try all he wants he will die in his sins from the most sacrificial human being to the worst pagan. No help, no options in and of yourself. Someone comes all the way up to Christ, all the way to his friendship, all the way to an honoring relationship, three years with him, listening to sermons and hearing his voice, watching his kindness, seeing his power, close, personal, trusted, and the Lord himself never outing him early, right up alongside the Lord, right next to him at the last moment. And even a gesture. And unless there is grace, there will be no hope. And so Jesus said when he prayed, to his heavenly father, John 17 records it. I was with my disciples, father, and I was keeping them in your name, which you've given me. And I guarded them and not one of them perished except the son of perdition that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And you think in your mind, this is unacceptable for God to be that sovereign. Oh, it ought to frighten you. This is unacceptable. How can that be? That must make God the author of evil. He is not the author of evil. The scriptures are clear. God does not apologize by putting all of his sovereignty on full display throughout scripture. God is good and holy and perfect. He is not evil. And yet he is sovereign over the existence of evil. And he certainly overpowers its inherent destruction so that it only accomplishes his will and it only magnifies his glorious attributes and perfections. But he himself is perfect and holy and righteous and not evil. Note the tension. Just listen to this, Isaiah 45, 7. I form light and create darkness. That's right, the word is there. I form light and create darkness. Yet 1 John 1, 5 says, in him there is no darkness at all. God doesn't apologize for that. Isaiah 45, 7, I make well and I create calamity. I am the Lord who does all these things. And yet Psalm 5, verse 4, for you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil cannot dwell with you. Even Habakkuk 1.13, you are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. And yet he is sovereign over all of it. So though he's sovereign over both good and evil, he's not tainted by it. He's morally pure and holy and good by nature. And yet his disposition toward evil is always to hate it and oppose it with a holy disdain. God is absolutely sovereign over every kind of evil and affliction, over the fall, sovereign over all of it. It ought to make us tremble. The Son of Man goes as has been determined. God determined to save. He determined to redeem. He determined to expose evil. He determined to bring the betrayer right up close. And it'll happen. And of course, did happen exactly as God had said. He's sovereign over evil rulers. Oh, we have, we have chaos right now in our culture and even lots of places across the world, evil rulers that make 
Christians tremble, and yet you ought to know, Daniel 2, 20 and 21, Daniel answered and said, that the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him, and he and it is he who changes the times and the epics. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. This is our God. You say, but persecution's coming. Listen, he's sovereign over persecutions. Yes, Satan and his demons, they go around and Satan seeks someone to devour, 1 Peter 5, 8. But 1 Peter 3, 17 it is better if God should will it so that you should suffer for doing what's right, certainly rather than for doing what's wrong. If God should so will it that you should suffer. John 10, 18, speaking of his sovereign power over the evil forces that wanted to take his life, Jesus says, no one takes it from me. I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down and I have authority to take it up again. He's even sovereign over Satan and his demons. Job chapter 1, Satan had to come ask permission. Satan even demanded permission to sift Peter like wheat. They always obey God. They always do exactly what he ultimately wills, even if in their defiance against God, they'll be judged for all their temporal evil acts. They obey his eternal will because they must. He's sovereign. He's even sovereign over this plot to kill the Lord. Did you know that Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 39, in that great finish there of the Pentateuch, this is what God says. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and give life. I have wounded, and it is I who heal, and there's no one who can deliver from my hand. Does that make you nervous? It's humbling. And Jesus, right here in this moment, says it to the disciples and to Judas. The Son of Man is going as it has been determined. That's right. Luke 22, 3 and 4, Satan entered into Judas. That was determined. The scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand concerning Judas. Acts 1, 16. Jesus was delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. Acts 2, 23. And you might be thinking, no, wait a minute. Satan blinds the minds of the unbelieving. We know 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says that. Yes, but did you know that God is sovereign over Satan's ability to do that. 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God said, light shall shine out of darkness, and that same God is the one who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. If light is going to burst forth on a human heart, it is the sovereign work of God's grace. God alone is the one who grants repentance and faith. God is sovereign over all these afflictions. John Piper said, the evil and suffering in this world are greater than any of us can comprehend, but evil and suffering are not ultimate. God is ultimate. Satan, the great lover of evil and suffering, is not sovereign. God is sovereign. And so, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. Darkness over the fellowship that night, yet sovereignty over the darkness. You say, well, then is Judas responsible? Yes. Notice we see judgment over the evil act. Judgment over the evil act, verse 22, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. You remember I said to you that Matthew records and Mark records that Jesus said it would, be, it would have been better had he not been born. 
He's better off unborn. Woe to that man by whom he's betrayed. Luke doesn't add that last statement, but the whole scene just indicates that every effort to reach the heart of Judas, every circumstance, every moment is right in front of him. His resistance to every effort raises his guilt to the highest degree. This is likely, as some scholars think, going to bring into the minds of the disciples the account of Ahithophel in 2 Samuel, who, of course, was himself the traitor to King David who also ended his life by hanging himself, 2 Samuel 16. This is guilt beyond measure. Woe to that man. It's a curse. It's everlasting, worst case scenario, this is it. And so they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. They still didn't quite understand it. You know, that's so typical of us with regard to truth, staring us right in the face sometimes. We're distracted. We're not very insightful at times. Our thinking is murky because we're selfish. We see things not from God's perspective quite often, but from our own perspective. The disciples sitting around the table were missing it because they'd made assumptions. Instead of running right to Christ uh, and, and literally not ceasing their questions until they had the specifics, instead of often running to truth and saying, Lord, teach us all that we need to know because we have a healthy distrust of our own perspective. Instead of that, they sat around and kind of thought well of themselves more than they should. They violated what Paul said in Hebrews, in Romans 12, you should never do. Think more highly of yourself than you ought to think. And instead of thinking so as to have sound judgment, they made assumptions just like we do. And we have to be corrected and we have to be shocked. Our minds have to be defibrillated because we're blinded and murky by our own selfishness. And that's what's happened here. They began to discuss among themselves which one of them might be. What do you mean which one it might be? He just dipped, said he was going to dip and gave it to the one and said what you do, do quickly. They were boasting of themselves in their heart. And so they saw themselves as innocent. Couldn't there have been one? Just one, maybe Peter. Jesus says, one of you will betray me. All right, just say it, Lord. I know it's me. I know it's me because If left to myself like I have been this three years of ministry, all I've ever done is put my foot in my mouth. Just tell the guys, it's me, it's over, I'm out. Just say it, I don't belong here. You washed our feet, I don't belong here. You pull me into the inner circle with James and John, I don't belong here. Just one. What was the problem? Even... As the Lord is alone, facing Satan alone, and the instrument of evil, Judas, they are not thinking of the Lord. They are thinking to defend their innocence, and they're thinking about their greatness, and they're making those silly mental comparisons that we make. Surely it can't be me. I've seen Andrew do some really bonehead things. And after all, Jesus keeps pulling Peter into his secret meetings with James and John. And James and John are always brash. Can you believe it? Asking their mother if they can sit on either side of the Lord. Who do they think they are? 
I couldn't be the betrayer. It's got to be those two guys. And if it isn't them, Peter, look at him skulk over there. This is what we do. And so right here in the upper room, the Lord Jesus is saying to his disciples in a gracious moment, while he is commissioning his betrayer, the human heart knows no bounds. Run to me. Distrust it. Distrust yourself. Don't think anything of yourself. Don't think that you can get by without grace. Don't think that you can walk without me. What a lesson. And they're going to get into a dispute. And even in that, the Lord was gracious, if you notice later, verse 28, you are those who have stood by me in my trials. Even when he said that, surely one of them must have thought, you are way too gracious, Lord. Me stand by you. Most of the time, I was glad Peter was the spokesperson because I was afraid. A healthy distrust. There must have been some of that in them because they had the Spirit. The Spirit was producing some of it. They're not the worst guys. They're the Lord's men. The Master's men. And the Lord kept them in his name. They had really changed. Their heart had really changed. He loved them. He loved them to the utmost. He was going to the cross for them and everyone who would be saved through their testimony. So it wasn't as though he had disdain for them. He was kind to them. You men have stuck, you've stuck with me, even though they just finished arguing about who's the greatest. No, 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 that's not the sum total of who you are. I saved you. The sum total of who you are is who I'm making you. By my grace, you'll get there. I've begun this great work. I'll complete it. Is that not an encouragement to us? What a blessed encouragement that, that in this room, he's all alone, and yet he is ministering to the disciples. He's showing them the human heart knows no bounds, and he's showing them to distrust their own heart. He's showing them never to imagine themselves without him, never to imagine they can do anything apart from him, bear any fruit on their own, sustain their own life. What a kind Savior on the night of his betrayal. What about us? Those lessons are profound, are they not? Some people attach themselves to the church and they live in pretense up next to the scriptures and up next to the people of God their whole life. And they're betrayers. And their life spins out of control, but they're hiding it for a time until finally the Lord exposes it. Or what about those it's never exposed in the life of and then they end up before the throne of grace? Lord, Lord. Didn't we do all these things in your name? I never knew you. You're just like Judas. Right up next to the Savior, absolute hatred for the truth. And then what an encouragement to us. What an admonishment to us. Why are you thinking so highly of yourself? Why are you comparing yourself with everyone around you? Why are you imagining you're better than anyone? Why are you imagining that you can bear fruit apart from Christ? We are the desperate, are we not? We're the not many mighty, not many noble, the desperate, the foolish people of the world whom God has chosen to shame the pride of humanity. Lessons are profound in a short moment. John's gospel says Judas immediately left. He was gone. If the sequence is as, the, as Matthew and Mark and John say it, then the Lord instituted this great new covenant moment with them. At some point in there, this dispute happened, probably immediately on the heels of it or just before communion. And then they went to the garden. 
The Lord would be alone one more time. The disciples still wouldn't understand. Even after all that, in his moment where he's going to be pounded with the fury of hell to reject the cross altogether, his disciples are sleeping. Couldn't stay awake with him for one hour. Oh, we just resonate with that, don't we? Lord, we can't stay awake with you one hour. We can't even get out of bed to come to church. And you, you came out of the grave to save souls. And we, we can't even get off the mattress. And yet he's kind. Come on. I'll grow you. I'll minister to you. I'll be your sustenance. He's all we have, isn't it? He's our everything. He went to the cross, commissioning his betrayer to get there. Bow with me. Lord, our pride is just crushed. How often we, just right in your face, think that we're something when we're nothing. And we try to do things in our own power and we stumble along. You try to teach us lessons over and over again, we stumble along. And when we don't have what we want in this life or what we believe would comfort us or fulfill us, we complain and cry and whine and and then grumble against you and then when you give us things that we don't deserve even if we've complained about them we thank you as if as if we never complained as if we just prayed and trusted your faithfulness we don't even at times seek forgiveness for how many ways that our prayers were filled with resentment for not having what we wanted Lord, how often we need to be reminded how the human heart knows no bounds. If left to ourselves, we'll, we'll implode, we'll be destroyed. We run to you. We should run to you all the time. We, we must have the vital nutrients of life in your spirit, through your word, flowing through your people all the time. And so often we have obstacles to that in our own selfishness. Forgive us for that and help us. May we be reminded that the human heart can go even as far as the folly of Judas who had it all and lost everything, trying to gain the whole world and losing his soul. The treachery right there at your table. Lord, redeem the fool among us. Open blind eyes and then teach us these lessons that we see in our dear brothers around your table there on that day. The things they didn't see, may we learn to see them. By distrusting our own heart and trusting you and your word. And quit opinionizing and arguing with the truth, embracing it by faith, knowing that you always fulfill your people. We thank you in our Savior's name we pray. Amen.